Hello, welcome to this session hosted by the Food Farming and Countryside Commission at which we are launching our new report, Farming for Change, Mapping a Route to Agroecology by 2030. It was just a, a year ago where I was sitting in Oxford, in fact, with some of our panel members and talking about uh, the work that uh, IDRI, the French think tank, had done across Europe. Um, and prompted us to commission our own work that time. It feels like a very, very long time ago, but it's lovely to be at least talking to you, even if we can't be together at, at Oxford this year. So for those of you that don't know, the Food Farming and Countryside Commission was a UK independent inquiry established in 2017 to look at the future of the food farming and countryside in the post-Brexit um, environment. We very quickly shifted our gaze to embracing some of the bigger challenges in front of us, even bigger than Brexit, if that's possible to imagine. The climate crisis, the nature crisis, the public health crisis, the crisis of diet-related ill health. We published our reports back in 2019, um, and our report, Our Future in the Land, was um, well received, much to our relief, and our funders, Esme Fairbairn Foundation and partners, invited us to continue our work to help put our recommendations into practice. So this year, in spring, this year 2020, last year now, gosh, in spring 2020, we launched as an independent charity, fully focused on helping to implement the recommendations contained in our report. One of those recommendations, a core recommendation, uh, was about the agroecological transition uh, to 2030. We said farming can be a force for change if we choose that path for the future. Um, and But quite rightly, people asked us some uh, very reasonable questions about whether, in fact, that pathway was, in fact, a plausible um, and reasonable path, pathway. And so we commissioned IDRI uh, to, to extend their, their modelling to the UK, to take their, their Europe-wide model and examine uh, that, that evidence for the UK without increasing granularity. Now, um, I'm delighted to be able to say that the answer to those big questions, you can pop my pop the slide up now, please. The answer to some of those big questions that we were asking, can agroecology, um, uh, the transition to agroecology provide uh, enough food? So the, sorry, the previous slide. Can we have the previous slide? That's the second slide, I need the first slide. Thank you. So the big question that we were asking in the report and we asked IDRI to test for us was whether or not we can grow enough healthy food for future UK population. And, uh, and the answer uh, to our, uh, our great satisfaction is, in fact, we can, whilst also ensuring future food security without, importantly, offshoring um, our environmental impacts by eliminating those economically and environmentally costly synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. It also enables us to support more diverse mixed farming enterprises with a greater variety of crops and breeds and landscapes across the UK. And more importantly, perhaps it doubles the amount of land available on farms for nature. It releases 1.2 million hectares of the current agricultural area for other uses, according to the to to uh, the needs that we determine. That might be greater uh, climate uh, mitigation, carbon sequestration, or ecosystem restoration. And the model shows that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by at least. 38% and with the possibility to offset a further 60% of the remaining emissions through those different scenarios that I just talked about earlier. Now, it does mean that we still have to face up to some really big questions. Next slide, please. 
And those sorts of questions require us to create the right enabling conditions for the transition to agroecology to take place. We need to accelerate changes in diet and take our government and business-sponsored actions on diet-related ill health and mal malnutrition. We need to scale up investment in the kinds of farming we need that supports agroecological enterprises, both for climate, for nature and health. And our other report published late last year called Farming Smarter starts to set out what needs to happen for that. Uh, and uh, it enables us to foster an enabling and connected policy environment that works for health, for communities, for climate and for nature. And perhaps most importantly of all, it talks about levelling the playing field for a fairer food system, fairer for farmers and producers, for citizens and for workers alike. Now, I'm delighted to say I have got the most excellent panel joining me today to explore some of those questions. Xavier Pou, who's the Associate Researcher at IDRI, who is the brains behind the report, will be explaining um, the modelling and the assumptions behind the report um, in much more detail to you shortly. I'm also su supported by Chris Howell, who's Head of Food and Landscapes at WWF UK. We have Joe Lewis with us, who's the Strategy and Policy Director at the Soil Association. And we have Ben Andrews, who's Agroecological Ambassador with the Soil Association, but more importantly, a real working farmer who in fact lives just up the road from me um, in Herefordshire, over the border from me in Wales. So I'm really looking forward to being able to explore some of those big questions and the features of the report, the prospects of the report with them shortly. But before we get into the discussion, let me turn to Xavier, who can describe for you some of the modelling and the assumptions that underpin the report today. Xavier, over to you. Thank you very much, Sue. So I will use a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you will pardon my French because I'm French. So uh, I will try to... Oh. So I guess it's working. Can you see the... the the first slide. So, uh, as you, uh, Sue said, I will present the, the, what is behind the, the, the results uh, that has been uh, presented uh, through the modeling exercise we have uh, performed for uh, uh, for transferring TIFA to the UK, as, as she said. So, uh, Xavier, sorry, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I I do not have your screen share to pull up for you. So you? if you'll go back to StreamYard and share your screen. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Apologize. All these technical problems, issues. So does it work like this? Can you confirm yes. it work, it's working? Yes, that, that is great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so of course, the, the, the origin of the, of the study stands in the following issue. We all know, we are all convinced that agroecology is a very good option for biodiversity, pesticide, free food, etc. But then there is a question that remains, is that producing enough uh, to cover the demand uh, side of the, of, the, of the equation? Because we know uh, that using less pesticides, relying on uh, organic nitrogen, will reduce the production. We have the example of organic farming and uh, we need to, 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 to address that. So this is basically what the model tends to address, the balance between supply and demand uh, at different levels of analysis. So just as for the demand side, very classically, we are dealing with combination of diet and waste. And I think that we need to have in mind uh, regarding this, uh, this dimension of the, uh, of the equation that we have more room of manner than we expect. Uh, firstly, we, it would be good news to reduce our food consumption in Europe and in UK in particular, where the, the obesity problem is uh, one of the most stringent in uh, all of Europe. And secondly, we might not have a vision of the food demand which is fixed. On the contrary, this is a figure uh, showing the, the changes uh, in meat consumption and in meat uh, related products showing that it's uh, moving anyhow. So we are not in a fixed uh, situation regarding the, the demand side. 
And then we have the supply, which is very, very classically against a combination of land use and yields. So this is all we need to model in the in order to assess whether agroecology is able to meet the, 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 the demand. On this aspect, we, are, we need to have two points in mind. The second is, of course, the importance of livestock in the demand side. You know all the, the issue about the importance of feed uh, in the livestock. Two thirds of the of the cereals and grains are used to feed cattle and uh, all kinds of animals, not only cattle. And second, uh, what we want to to assess in TIFA as well is the ability to close the nitrogen cycle. Uh, with organic uh, and uh, uh, legume-based nitrogen only. So in order to do, to do so, uh, we used the uh, work of, model, of modeling that we, we did at the EU level that Sue mentioned two years ago now. Uh, and this, by using a biomass balance model, uh, we could uh, calculate that on the paper and at, at this average level, there was enough land in Europe to feed more than 500 million Europeans, provided a change in diet, of course, and less losses and waste. Uh, I would say that about loss and waste, just to, to, to anticipate uh, questions about this, this is not the central assumption in TIFA. We only uh, assume a 10% reduction in, in such losses and waste in order to concentrate and to focus on the agronomical aspect of, of, the, of, the, of the issue. Second, we concluded that it's possible to close the nitrogen cycles with end fixing crops only. And this all, of course, goes along a combination of nitrogen fixing crops in rotations and pro, uh, pro, uh, pro, um, provision from uh, permanent grasslands. And in terms of environment, we had positive outcomes in terms of biodiversity, natural resources management, of course, and greenhouse gas emissions with a less 40 percent compared as compared with 2010. So during the two last years, uh, we have developed a similar conceptual Xavier, approach. I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt again. Um, we were wondering if we can get your screen shared to be full screen. Your slides are half screen in some kind of animation uh -huh. view. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so, also, for example, what what are you seeing right now? I see on the right side the slide that you okay. desire, and on the left a black screen uh, for a scene so change. I was I was mixing that. Sorry. Um, we're also going to provide a link uh, for all the viewers um, to the website where they can access these slide decks. Okay. I'm just sorry about that. So that you do you see a slide yeah, this which is, is perfect not... thank you okay. apologize for all this tech problem apologize uh, so i was speaking about the the regionalization of uh, of tifa so we started with the broad picture at the european level where you can see on the top of the screen tifa uh, model and then the issue was to assess whether a combination of regions regions across europe with their own peculiarities in terms of productivity, land use, etc., geography, uh, could uh, supply, could meet the, the, the overall needs in terms of production at this level. So this was uh, nearly a more granular analysis uh, for this uh, for these prospects, taking into account the different yields, uh, going further than the averaging at the European level. So in order to do so, we needed to uh, to build a regional typ typology. This has been done at the NETS2 uh, level, granulogy. So NETS2 is just a statistical unit for Eurostat, where you can find most of the needed data to, to, to do such a, a modeling. Here you can see the map displaying of the 21 agrarian regions at the European level. This is a balance between too complex and too simplistic. And then when we come to the UK, of course, we come to only three regions, which might be a bit frustrating, but uh, we think it, tells, it begins to tell something about uh, what is at stake in, 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 um, in developing agroecology. So we have uh, three agrarian regions. Uh, in red, the western deep uh, soil plain 
producing a lot of crops, arable mainly. In dark green, you have the grass systems of the northern Atlantic hills and plains, temperate. And in light green, you have the uh, grass systems of the British islands, mostly in Scotland, but, uh, in Scotland, but uh, not only. Of course, uh, these regions are distinct uh, for yields balance between arable grassland and rough grazing in terms of land use livestock density and of course the, the the components of the nitrogen balance and from this set at the european level we needed to reconstruct the uk uh, agricultural uh, system we are aware that there is uh, some viability inside each region of course, we know that Scotland is not an homogeneous region, neither the two other, but uh, the modeling exercise and the statistical analysis is such that the variability within each region is less than within, uh, within uh, between each region. I apologize for this. So this was the uh, statistical frame we were working. We apologize, it does not fully account the nations and it would be another piece of work uh, okay so then we had the set of assumptions to apply to the model so these are the, the assumptions firstly that the, the change of diets uh, towards more health, more health i will come back to this the land use prioritized for food production first and then biodiversity and then non-food users uh, the need to close nitrogen and nutrient management cycles at a landscape level uh, based on the integration of livestock and arable systems, which means removing all kinds of nitrogen external inputs. Uh, as for the use of pesticides, as for biodiversity and health, we use the precautionary approach uh, by re removing them entirely. And uh, then grassland is used to support extensive livestock systems. So we have the basis for the modeling and then the output. So uh, we started with the change in diet. I will go uh, too quickly about this issue, I'm afraid. But uh, what you have to, to take uh, the tank home message is that divide by two halving the consumption of meat and dairy and dividing by five the consumption of sugar. I think the, the, the baseline situation is a bit alarming about sugar. And as for fruits and vegetables and pulses, you can see the, the coefficients of uh, multiplication, the increase. For the rest of uh, foodstuff, there is no uh, such uh, notable uh, changes. So if we go, uh, if we sum up this at the uh, UK level, we can calculate some changes in domestic needs. So first, we have to take into account the, the population is expected to rise by 16% between now and 2050, uh, which is our time horizon. And uh, we might find uh, a bit striking that even with this increase of population, you may see lesser demand in cereals and pulses and legumes. And this comes, of course, from the change in diet with uh, animal-based products. So the less demand you have on this side, of course, uh, it reduces the pressure and the demand on cereals and pulses and legumes that today are mostly used to feed animals. So there is less need to have higher uh, yields, if I may say. So if I come to this yields question, we used the Ponicio meta-analysis uh, on organic farming yields. And uh, we applied a coefficient, taking into account the uh, expected impact of climate change. So here is a map displayed by the European Environmental Agency three years ago, showing that across Europe, of course, the impacts of uh, climate change might lead to lower or higher yields. And in the UK, you have uh, the middle of the, of, the, of the island, which is expected to have an increase by 10%. So this, taking this into account uh, led to different yields so you if you have the, the figures uh, between less 25 percent or uh, 10 percent depending on the on the on the nature of crops so with this and the combination of assumptions on livestock which i i will not display due to the time we could uh, assess changes in land use which is myth meeting the supply of uh, of the calculated demand so uh, here are the the changes you have to have in mind that in 2010 
uh, the, these figures do not account the import of 3 million tons of soya. So we have offshore land, which is hidden in these stats. And second, when you come to the outcomes of the, of the model, you can see that we have uh, one, two uh, point million hectare release for flexible use, mostly in Scotland and, or in, sorry, in British Highlands. Uh, uh, so this is a, a point to, 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 to discuss. We can, we can use it for other purposes than uh, the, the strict food balance. Uh, I mentioned the nitrogen dimension, which is crucial. So very classically, we calculated a balance between the needs of exports and the supply uh, consisting in different sources of nitrogen. And at the end, we had a very tight ratio of 110%, meaning that we have a bit more uh, nitrogen supplied at this regional level. Uh, this is consistent with the assumption of uh, very, very efficient use of nitrogen under organic form, which is slow released and thus very efficiently used by plants. This nitrogen uh, dimension uh, goes also with the greenhouse gas emission uh, calculation, where you can see that most of the, uh, of the reduction of those emissions come from the reduction in ni nitrous oxide, uh, which is a long lasting, very powerful greenhouse gas. So we reach the same results as other uh, carbon path or climate path, if I may say, but through another uh, playing on, on another variable, which is nitrogen. So this is a, a very strong uh, uh, result for, for us. So in order to conclude, I, I'm afraid I spoke uh, too long right now. So we can here yeah, we can compare the performances, the outcomes of agroecology against uh, highly input uh, dependent farming, and we can see that the results are quite comparable for uh, or even superior for many aspects, except maybe bioeconomy, which is another uh, issue to, to to discuss. But one could anticipate because before those calculations that there would be shortcomings in climate change mitigation and the provision of food balance. And this is not the case, of course, this is not the case, only provided that we can uh, anticipate a change in diet and food behavior uh, as, a, as a whole. So I have uh, identified two questions for what, uh, to conclude my, my, my talk. First, in terms of biophysical and land use, there is the, is the question of, what is the best use of the released land between afforestation, open grazed landscape, or wildlife? So this is a question to, 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 to be further investigated. And second, there is a question of granulometry uh, at the, the UK level, uh, taking into account the territory landscape, farm, or even nation level uh, on this aspect. And uh, on the social economic, it echoes, of course, what Sue has presented, the, 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 the issue of fostering the food chains uh, in order to properly valuing agro agroecological assets, which is not the, the case uh, in the way they are labeled, for example, and the organization of uh, fertility management at a territorial level to keep into account labor force constraints, etc. So there are, of course, many other questions, but this is the, the, these are the ones I identified. So thank you very much for your attention. Again, pardon my French, and I hope I have not been too confusing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xavier. That was um, a brilliant race through uh, what I know is a really detailed and sophisticated body of work, which viewers can find on our web pages. And I know that's in the Crowdcast chat. One of the things that I think is really important about the work is that it looks at the whole system. A quote that I was reminded of today from John Muir. Um, a farmer, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And we can sometimes get overwhelmed when we try and understand the enormity of a system. And it's why in our report, um, summing up some of the really key findings of the IDRI work for us, we have picked out five critical questions. We picked out the diet question, the carbon question, uh, the livestock question, the question around productivity and yields, and the question around nature and space for nature. 
So when you take a look at our report, you'll see how we have started to interpret Idri's work through the lens of those big, if you like, zeitgeist questions of our time. Right. Now, I'm going to um, bring in uh, my friend and colleague, Joe Lewis from the Soil Association. Joe, both of our organisations were really impressed, weren't we, with the uh, TIFA EU work back in 2018. And, uh, and Soil Association took a lead in inviting Yudri to present it at the first Peter Melchett Memorial Lecture a couple of years ago now. So tell us a little bit more about why this research is important from the Soil Association's point of view. Yes, I think what caught our attention first about um, Idri's work was the way that it explicitly set out to join the dots between climate and nature and health. Uh, I think too much modelling uh, is still done in silos, particularly now from a climate perspective, uh, and in failing to join the dots with nature, with health, with animal welfare, antimicrobial resistance, the risk of course is that that could lock us into pathways that could make those other problems worse. I think what also was great to see in the in the IDRI work was um, some challenge to those lazy assumptions about uh, organic and agroecology and the so-called feeding the world challenge. Uh, it really brought into focus that of course, with our current farming system, we're not feeding the world. The world is feeding us, or rather it's feeding our, our livestock. And this agroecology model is actually charting a pathway to uh, weaning us off that dependency on imported animal feed. I'd say perhaps my greatest hope, Sue, for the UK model um, is that it might disrupt and ideally terminate um, this unhelpful debate about land sharing versus land sparing for nature because what the IDRI modeling has done is show that we can as of course we must do both uh, it's possible to farm with nature to slash pesticide use uh, to restore soils at the same time to spare land uh, for natural habitat, for trees at the farm level and at the national level. And what makes that possible is that focus in the model on the demand side, on diet, on halving grain-fed meat. And it's it's only, uh, Professor Tim Benton has just given a, a fantastic lecture over at the Oxford uh, Farming Conference uh, and has consistently argued that it's only on the demand side that we can achieve land sparing because intensification, increasing yields, uh, just drives down commodity prices and fuels cheap meat, obesity, food waste. It doesn't actually uh, deliver uh, land sparing. Before Sue comes back in. Yeah, uh, yeah I could, here I, I am. Add. <laughs> yeah, so here, here, here I am. I was just starting my question without actually having my mic turned on there. Sorry. I was, I was just going to say there, Joe, at the Soil Association, you've been advocating this, these kinds of changes for decades. How are you gauging now the intentions of policymakers and, and of course, citizens to support them, to embrace them now? I think in some ways it's been very encouraging over the last year, particularly seeing how uh, conservation NGOs, environment NGOs are, are really coming together and strengthening their advocacy for agroecology through groups like the Climate Coalition, which causes that interface with citizens in the lead up to COP uh, and Wildlife and Countryside Link. Um, it's also been encouraging to see the Climate Change Committee um, moving in this direction on diet. Uh, in particular. So their land use team has taken an active interest in the IDRI modelling uh, and their sixth carbon budget, which was published just before Christmas, uh, has now finally moved to advocating a reduction in white meat, in grain fed meat, uh, and not just this focus on red meat and methane. And that's in recognition of the impacts of animal feed production for biodiversity as well as for climate and, and land use change. Um, the concern remains with the Climate Change Committee's modelling that they're just not comfortable yet with, with, with fully integrating 
uh, with uh, a nature model, would be, what would be the plan for nature. Um, and that means that their net zero plan does rest on some quite implausible um, yield assumptions, uh, which don't factor in the need to radically reduce nitrogen use, pesticide use mm -hmm. and restore soils. I think yeah, the last piece of question has to be thinking about DEFRA and the Farm uh, Agriculture Transition Plan. Mm -hmm. Those plans still aren't yet attaching themselves in any way to a clear vision uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that matches to any extent the EU's farm to fork uh, strategy with its really clear targets around halving pesticide use, slashing nitrogen use and uh, scaling up organic farming to 25% mm -hmm. of the total farmland. Um, so I think we really need to come together uh, and insist that uh, the new farm support plan at Elms really does reward a whole farm approach to public goods and isn't just funding. You know, the risk is it, it moves to funding nice projects in the field margins against the backdrop of an unreformed farming system. Yeah, you, you've raised some. You raised as many questions there, Joe, um, as the IDRI report. Uh, provides provides answers as as indeed I did at the start and and did Xavier. All good research raises important questions, and I know you're planning on tackling some of those now in the next phase of research that we're going to be working together on um, from here. Do you want to say a little bit more about that and where we're going to go next with this? Yes, of course. So um, I think many farmers. Uh, will quite rightly be asking the questions now about the feasibility of this transition to agroecology in, in social and economic terms. You know, what does it mean for farm businesses right across the UK? Uh, and thanks to funding from the Esme Fairburn Foundation, the Soil Association is going to be commissioning some modelling of the implications for farm business economics, uh, looking at the implications of, of the transition seeing how we can build a stronger picture of what it will take to really support farmers to make this transition in terms of uh, farm support, in terms of food prices, uh, private markets for ecosystem services, uh, for instance. And also, what does this look like in economic terms from a natural capital perspective, both at the farm level uh, and at the macro level, given that's such a, a guiding influence for, for DEFRA's planning? Um, we also want to delve into the implications for, for supply chains of all this complexity and diversity um, and ideally also look at um, what are the opportunities in an agroecology scenario for, for more diversity also in the farming community. Is there an opportunity to, um, to foster a whole new generation of more diverse entrants to farming? Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring in Chris Howe now from WWF. Hi, Chris. Great Hi, to have thanks. you with us. Thank you. For, thank you for joining us. Now, WWF has also been producing its own work uh, and own reports on these sorts of questions for for a long while and, and in a way strengthening the arguments for agroecology. Do you want to tell me um, about some of the recommendations that you've been making? Yes, thank you. Um, let me just switch screens. Um, so thanks, thanks for inviting me to, to comment uh, on the report and participate on, on the panel. So I'm Chris Howe, I'm Head of Food and Landscapes at WWF UK. Um, my team are involved in projects and advocacy on food and landscapes and in the UK and indeed in other countries. Um, so WWF, campaigns for a future where people live in harmony with nature and, and so when it comes to landscapes that means achieving the triple challenge of sustainable food production, recovery of nature and contributing to preventing dangerous climate change. So in terms of some of the work in the reports we've produced uh, just recently last year a global report on, uh, on meeting the triple challenge with some case studies including the UK. Um, we also recently produced a report that shows the contribution of nature-based solutions in, in British landscapes to preventing dangerous climate change, but it's the bringing together of all of those things which this report today um, does, it, well, it does in a way which we, we perhaps haven't, haven't seen before. So, I mean, it's been fantastic to see the report come to life and, and to hear Xavier's presentation today because it shows some of these tangible scenarios that would, that would facilitate or allow key policy and societal aspirations to be met. I mean, for example, 
the Lawton report from 10 years ago, Making Space for Nature. I mean, Dieter Helm's Blueprint for Rescuing the UK Countryside, Restoration of Natural Capital, 25-Year Environment Plan, the Nature Recovery Network, and in Wales, the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, which you know, in, in its own way should pave the way for full agroecological approach. Um, we recently, uh, WF Cymru just recently published a report showing how the food system could adopt an agroecological approach along with all of the other complementary measures, some of which are touched in today's paper to, to achieve that. And, and as today's paper says, I mean, this includes treating landscapes as a whole. You need to have large, well-managed connected areas for wildlife, as well as hedgerows, copses and ponds and meadows within farms, good soil and water management, and heavily reduced or eliminated artificial inputs. And the, the exciting thing about this paper is it, it brings that together and says, well, if you do these things, you can free up that space, you can manage that within some big shifts uh, in, in diets and policy. Um, of, as the authors would confirm, you know, one size doesn't fit all when it comes to transition to agroecology, but the principles and the agroecological yes. approach, when you couple that at a landscape level with space for nature and nature-based solutions to climate and other societal needs, that's the priority to make sure we're living within our means and not continuing to erode our natural capital. So, so when we look at this at a global level in WWF and we think about ways of describing it, the jurisdictional approach or the landscape approach, um, it's as important in a Southeast Asian oil palm landscape or an American soy landscape as it is in a North European arable livestock or root crop landscape. And those, those shifts are driven by a combination of public policy, private sector standards, finance, and social appetite. And what we found um, globally and, and in discussions in the UK is that there's, there's a growing both a public consciousness and appetite for reform, um, but there's also this growing cohort of governments that want to commit to sustainable production. Um, and they want both public policy and supply chain standards and buyer demand to, to come together to, to help drive that shift. So what we see in this report today is, is if you have a dietary shift and you have uh, a change in demand and you have the right kind of support, then you can you can transition to these to these landscapes. And obviously this is a huge challenge. I mean, a dietary shift alone would be a significant change. We've already touched on that. Um, mm -hmm. Land uses to change, which land, who will be affected, how will that transition be just and supported, where will that support come from, and how do you avoid just shifting it to another landscape or another country? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'll just very quickly touch on the answers to that and then stop. It's, um, you know, some of these things, a reform system of public payments, we've already heard about that in the UK. Um, but the financiers of food growing operations, the buyers and sellers, the importers and exporters, they all they all play their, their role, whether it's loans or preferential rates from financiers, prices paid to farmers, the cost of food in the supermarket, the, the inclusive processes focused on natural capital for deciding how that landscape gets transformed, penalties for eroding natural capital, standards on supply chains. So these, these are some of the areas where the solutions need to be worked through and where WWF is hoping to have made or, or to make a contribution to the debate. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Now, one of the reasons that we use the agroecology definition rather than other definitions like regenerative agriculture is because we, we want to align ourselves with the UN FAO definition of agroecology, which sets as much store by a, a just and fair food and farming system as it does to some of the, if you like, agronomic practices that are part of organics and regenerative and so on. But of course, that means confronting some big questions of power and risk and benefit in the food system. And right now, I think it would be um, not uncontroversial to say that we have an increasingly consolidated um, and um, uh, 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 in intensivized agriculture system in which uh, risks and re rewards are not fairly shared at all. And so I guess if we are advocating, as we are strongly, the shift towards more agroecological food systems, um, some of the biggest agribusinesses are the ones who are going to have to think hard about how they go about their businesses in the moment. And I know WWF works hard with those sorts of businesses to help them make that transition to what do you think their appetite is to first of all come to terms with the shift that's needed and to start changing their practices 
Th thanks. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big question, and I'll try and be brief um, to to allow the, the, the remaining speakers. But and there is certainly a growing appetite um, amongst those businesses for for change. I think one of the overriding principles that we find when we talk to um, whether it's financial sector or supply chain or, or agricultural suppliers is is the need for a level playing field. Um, if some of those businesses take uh, a strong stand, you know, wh whether it's excluding deforestation, palm oil from their supply chains into the UK, or whether it's excluding bad, you know, potatoes from farms that have bad soil and water management in the UK, you know, mm -hmm. either of those two extremes, um, if they take a strong stand there and say, well, look, we've got our, we've got our buying, buying policy, we've got our, our standards, and we won't accept that, um, will someone else just, will they just go and sell to somebody else? Will it find its way into the into the uh, onto the supermarket shelf, irrespective? So I think that um, that's probably one of the overriding um, principles that needs to be tackled. And so it will always be a combination of public policy and and I think in terms of this global picture, that's global public policy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the, there are a series of dialogues going right now, gone right now, led by the UK government, aimed at the uh, climate COP next year. Where, um, where, where we hope, you know, countries will come together and say, here's here's a minimum standard that we that we would expect to be applied. So it's a very strong combination of public policy and private sector action and drivers. Um, mm -hmm. But it's very difficult for one or two or even three leading retailers or agri businesses mm -hmm. to, to put that in place and just be undercut by, mm -hmm. uh, by those who are not meeting the standard. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. So much to discuss there. Now I'm going to bring in our last speaker um, for this afternoon, Ben Andrews, who is uh, my farmer neighbour just up the road in Herefordshire. Ben, are you there? Hi, Sue. Hi. Hi, Ben. Lovely to see you. Now, you and I are both farmers and um, and we both get to think about a bit of policy as well. But we both know that actually all of these reports and um, recommendations don't amount to very much if they don't work on the ground for farmers and growers. Tell me a little bit about how you are making agroecology work for you in your farm business. Well, we've been certified organic uh, 20 years now, uh, went uh, fully converted in 2001. So it's been um, quite a journey to get to this point, but it's uh, there's still a lot, uh, a lot we've got to do. So if we look at um, uh, the different enterprises we've got on our farm, so we're a proper mixed farm, fattening beef cattle, uh, growing vegetable crops, um, brassicas and salad crops, and then we have the um, arable side as well. So all of these enterprises are inextricably linked we've got the manure from the cattle that fertilizes soil um, for the vegetable crops we've got the um, the uh, straw byproduct from the cereals which goes to bed the cattle in the winter when it's uh, too cold and wet out on the uh, the river meadows for them to be grazing so that's the old-fashioned uh, way of farming that um, that we've always done, really. But there are some things that we've started looking at with the vegetables in particular um, to try to deal with uh, some of the pest burden we get. So, of course, aphids, whitefly, um, big issues on the uh, on the crops. So this year, well, la last year, we uh, experimented with planting strips of um, flowering plants, buckwheat and phacelia throughout the brassicas. Uh, the intention of this is to encourage beneficial insects such as hoverfly, whose larvae feed on, on aphids. Um, and it did a fantastic job. It's absolutely buzzing with life. And it's not only providing this benefit for our, for our crops, but it's also providing uh, nectar-rich pollinating flowers for, um, uh, for bees, for butterflies, uh, so many species of butterfly. Uh, and then on the lettuce, the aphid, we have not seen an aphid in five years, um, just from letting ladybirds 
do, do their thing. That, um, that, that's extraordinary. I mean, I, I can't tell you the fun I have with aphids in my cottage garden, so I'll be popping straight up to, for your aphid secrets. Yeah, and uh, we also started to see, um, so we spotted a family of otters on our riverbank uh, just recently. And if you've got otters, then you know you've got fish in the river. And if you've got fish in the river, you know that we've actually got trout, brown trout in there. And if you've got trout in there, then you've got uh, mayflies. And you can only have mayflies if you don't have a watercourse that is uh, contaminated with pesticides. So it's all these little things that we see um, that we see now starting to sort of live alongside nature. The the fantastic thing about the the invertebrates we we've got that are you know the beneficial insects eating on the uh, eating the pests, but we've also now started to see a lot more birds come in. So we've got um, sort of wagtails, skylarks, meadow pipits. Uh, we've got areas that we've set aside for um, for ground nesting birds, lap, such as lapwings. We have under the countryside stewardship scheme. We have wild bird seed mixes, reed buntings. Um, uh stone chats every thousands of finches and it's it's fantastic to see it and to see that we can still be a productive and profitable farm with this big increase in biodiversity brilliant thank you now let's be let's be honest there are some folk who have been saying for some considerable time that agroecology is a kind of niche artisan even hippie alternative to farming and it's not really for the mainstream how does this debate feel like for you with your farming neighbors what kind of conversations are you having with the good farmers of Herefordshire I, I think there are there's very much um a, a, a train of thought that it's you know if you don't spray it then it's not worth growing um but I have spoken to a lot of contemporaries who are conventional farmers, big conventional farmers, who are starting to adopt these agroecological principles with companion cropping, integrated pest management, and mm. they're seeing massive reductions in their synthetic inputs. Mm. Uh, and it's it's fantastic to see that and, and, and to chat with them. And I think that us organic farmers can also learn a lot from them in terms of the the precision that they that they work to because they, you know they're on such tight margins that everything has to be so um, so precise and you know, we can farm using these these agroecological principles but we need to use a bit of science as well with it and, and to, to sort of focus on on how we can improve and in, um, our productivity uh, whilst at the same time allowing space for, for biodiversity. And one, one last question, Ben, before we go on to questions from um, from the viewers. Our governments at the moment are really thinking hard about the kind of support that farmers need to transition uh, away from the common agricultural policy into new farming systems. What would you like to see government doing to support farmers in a transition to agroecology? I, I definitely think there needs to be uh, more training um, as opposed to just handing out cash uh, I think the the skills gap is is quite large in, in so it's quite a large shift going away from from um, from what is conventional farming mm -hmm. to this agroecological principle and to to give the training to show that it works I think is the first step. Um, also, I think that rather than a lot of these countryside stewardship schemes are done in isolation on farm to farm basis. It would be good to see more collaboration with farms, um, especially when the report is is extolling the virtues of mixed farming. But um, rather than every farm turning into a mixed farm, if there's an arable farm next door to a livestock farm, more collaboration with um, nutrient exchange of straw for for, for manure or, or silage to, to try and close that that loop without farm. Yeah all having to, um, to to go into these these mixed farming systems. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. It's loads of questions pouring in 
um, from the Crowdcast. So I'm going to try and just pick out a few and and we're going to be moving over into a workshop after this. So we'll be able to pick up some more then. But let's just try and pick up a few here. I'm going to start um, with a question about affordability, actually, because it is another of those um, uh, almost um, you know, too hard questions. The, the, the question becomes too hard for people to really approach, but it's critical to um, a fair and just transition. And um, we, we're being asked, what kind of work are we doing next on the affordability of agroecologically produced, sustainably produced food? Joe, do you want to come in and say something about that to start with? And uh, and, I, and Xavier, I'll come to you too on that question. Got folk coming in. question i mean there are different ways into this question one around um you know, how can we um make sure that we're targeting um research and putting in place the right um policy framework to uh to reduce some of the costs associated with organic and agroecological food currently being a niche not having the scale economies etc not receiving the the research investment um that uh for instance, crop varieties, livestock varieties associated with high input use are receiving. So there's definitely scope for uh, productivity increase associated with agroecological food, which could bring prices down. But I think the bigger question here is probably about um, you know, how do we um, escape the cheap food paradigm, though? And again, this is uh, Tim Benton has just given a fantastic talk about this at the Oxford Farming Conference. I think we've been stuck in a bind where... Um, we've allowed the fact that we have some of the highest levels of food insecurity um, in Europe to, to be an argument against raising food standards. Um, and we have to separate the two and we have to make sure that it's social welfare policy um, that provides the safety net for households at risk of food insecurity uh, while we continue to make sure that we are paying the true cost of food. Uh, so um, I think what we need... Um, to be to be doing is to be accepting that farm grape prices do need to be higher and making sure that we're designing policies um, that can make sure that it's not um, it, uh, what we we're not trying to gear the system around providing cheap processed food. It's about supporting subsidising more affordable, nutritious food. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just change the, the question a little and, and uh, ask Xavier and, and, and indeed Chris might want to answer this. Does, does the research uh, into the difference uh, um, to soil quality uh, start to feed through into the nutritional content of food? So might we see a scenario where, in fact, if the nutritional quality of the food that we're producing improves as a result of agroecological practices, we just need to be consuming a lot less of those cheaply produced commodities? Xavier? So this is a very sharp question. Can we use this word? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the uh, and uh, I'm not a, an expert to to answer this uh, in very precise terms. I think that's what the agroecology provides is an overall frame which gives room for this kind of questions. So if I may say, as long as we go on with high inputs uh, of fertilizers, synthetic mineral fertilizers or uh, agrochemicals, we will have very, very little room for having high quality, high nutri nutritive food. So we cannot say that in TIFA we will model this, clearly not. But we can say that we have a lot of favorable factors uh, heading towards more nutritious and healthy food. So first of all, we should uh, say that removing pesticides is not a small issue. It's a big one as for health. Uh, with all the, the, the disease uh, we know. And I think uh, I want to stress also on a good example for me, which is the share of omega-3 in the, in the animal products we, we have from permanent grassland uh, compared with the grain on soya-fed animals. So I cannot answer very, very sharply to this answer, but I, what I can say is that the provision of organic fertilization to soil is a very good way to favor uh, nutritious food. Brilliant, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna take another question because it's um we've we've, a, we've only got a tiny amount of time before we um have to finish this. 
let's talk about the, the scale of land use change. We'll start with you, Chris, and then perhaps come to you as well, Zadia. What kind of scale do you see land use change occurring? And, and how is that distributed across, across landscapes? Are you coming to me, Sue? Yes, Chris, sorry. Yes. I mean, I think the scale that's that's set out in in the report is is a substantive shift. And um, while we don't know for sure that the uh, that that the areas we're talking about um, uh, would be sufficient for say for for nature recovery or for nature based solutions to the climate, I mean, it what it does show is that um, it, that that's a substantive area and to, to shift away from food production to other uses, whether it's nature-based solutions or other mixed uses or nature recovery, as the paper says, would require um, a significant um, investment of time, stakeholder engagement and, uh, and, and transitional support. Um, what that actually means um, is obviously a lot harder to say um, when you bring it down from a national level to a devolved administration, or a region or a catchment. And I think that's where some of the most important and interesting work needs to be done to, to run scenarios or models um, that are not, not only scientific, but, but social and cultural within landscape scale, um, within landscape scale scenarios. And that, that, that really means large landscapes, large catchments, possibly regions, um, that, that sort of scale. Um, because the UK is very diverse, the UK is very heterogeneous, and and um, it won't be the same everywhere. So, if to boil it down to some of the simple questions, you know, where where are those where are those grasslands going to be restored? Where are those woodlands going to be planted? You know, where are those um, wildlife corridors going to be? That that requires a mix of science and and society to decide. And um, now, like I said earlier, we have some of those policy frameworks and directions. I mean, we had Lawton more than 10 years ago. We've got the Nature Recovery Network pilots in England. Um, there, are, there are pilot processes going on in all kinds of places across the UK to, to try and work out with stakeholders what that transformed landscape might look like. Um, we don't know yet exactly how that's going to work. We don't know if you did that everywhere in the UK, whether it would add up. Um, but what this report shows us is that um, a shift to agroecology and a shift in diets would mean that that land could be freed up in principle. The precise decisions are, are a matter for the stakeholders and society. Thank, thanks, Chris. We, we're gonna move over to um, a workshop immediately after this. And so there'll be lots of opportunities, people to ask us questions um, over there. Uh, and, and apparently there, there are potentially 400 people who might join us in, in that Zoom call. So um, we can we can really engage in the questions. But by way of wrapping up this particular session, just want to thank you all so much for joining us in this conversation. Thank you, Xavier, for the work that you've done in producing the technical modelling that is so critical to the report that we produced and which is really going to inform our work from, from here on in. Thank you to the ORSC team for making this all happen. We really appreciate this opportunity to launch our report at this brilliant, now global conference. So just finishing up, maybe a, a couple of lines from each of you about what, what, what you're feeling most optimistic about in what some might say are quite dark times right now, but that you can look forward to in in the food and farming sector. Joe, I'm going to start with you. Well, I think yeah, you'd have to say we've got this opportunity for to run in 2021 with the year that 2020 was supposed to be in terms of these big global summits on climate and nature and health. I think my my optimism is that we're increasingly um, as a as a NGO community coming together to make sure that those are integrated agendas, and this is the model um, that can help us to to, to join those dots uh, and to challenge those other scenarios that only seek to deliver on 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 one aspect, not all. Thank you, Ben. What are you feeling optimistic about in twenty twenty one? I'm feeling optimistic about uh, return of uh, wildlife 
to farms. Um, I think there's a, a move, um, especially with farmers, a lot more interested in biodiversity and uh, seeing uh, seeing an increase in that. Thank you, Chris. You have to be really quick. Yeah, feeling optimistic about governments around the world committing to sustainable supply chains in November. Brilliant, thank you. And Xavier, what are you feeling optimistic about over in France? You're on mute. <laughs> we had to have that to finish up. Oh, we're missing Xavier's final contribution because you're on mute. Sorry. Oh, Shane, quickly, Sorry. show us your insects again. I think you were talking about comes from the fact that the issues we are discussing are meeting a very strong social demand in yeah. terms of food quality, of landscapes, of biodiversity and good food. So we are not alone. Even we have a lot of adverse forces against us. I think we are not alone from power. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody, for listening uh, and for joining in with your questions. We're going to whiz over now to the Zoom workshop. The link should be in the Crowdcast. So those of you that want to join us for some more chat, we'll see you over there right now. Bye-bye.